Casey Thanks, Amos, for the short introduction. Uh, if most of the uh, people who have joined today uh, like are new or uh, haven't uh, had the opportunity last week to have my introduction. As Amo said, yes, we um, we both in fact are classmates. We both studied together, and uh, fortunate that Amos gave me this opportunity to give the relationship how um, uh, to utilize the uh, academic studies and correlate with what happens in industrial scale. Um, there are so many people out there sometimes when I've come through across uh, my experience in my first couple of years that they don't believe um, the simulations or the theoretical knowledge uh, does exist and uh, is also applied in actual pr practical case. So I would be able to, I'll be able to walk you through uh, in today's uh, case where I'll be talking about how wind turbine design uh, from scratch it takes place um and uh, specifically talking about wind turbine tower the design about on wind turbine tower as well as uh, the model analysis as short demo how we will uh, we carry out a model analysis and determine the frequencies and uh, make sure the tower is uh, safe from its uh, different kinds of uh, resonant frequencies that it experiences when the uh, rotor comes in uh, near uh, resonant frequency ranges. Let me start sharing you the slide. Is my audio clear? Voice clear? Started putting up the slide. Are you able to see that? Yeah. Um, okay. This uh, presentation was already I had uh, uh, done this couple of times. I had uh, previously an opportunity at uh, Indian Institute of Science some uh, back in 2016 uh, as a white paper presentation uh, where. I had to present it uh, how the tower uh, stiffness is considered uh, when resonance takes place every day uh, every day of the year, like throughout its uh, turbine life. Uh, so, I, so some people were not, not able to know how uh, to control whenever um, what happens when the uh, blade uh, which passes in front of it, it will try to resonate. So before i jump uh, deep dive into those things let me walk you through uh, the co complete contents 
So uh, before I tell the tower concept, you need to know how wh what is the reason uh, the tower uh, is being designed in a state where you have to decide the parameters like the length of the the height of the turbine. So height of the tower is important in uh, as a crucial uh, design factor. Then also is the diameter, then the location where it, it is being placed, and what are all the forces that is being considered. Oh, what are the geometry, uh, geometry construction and mass that is being applied on top of it? How much mass it is weighing? Then we would also consider the uh, the natural frequency of the tower along with the foundation. Uh, I won't be taking much uh, details about the foundation because that itself is a completely different chapter altogether. Then we see how uh, in the operation point of view, like day-to-day -day operation, uh, turbine has got various modes of operation. So how the tower gets affected because of that and uh, the life, uh, fatigue life as well as its design life gets reduced. So these are all the whole thing that I'll be walk walking through. Uh, if you have any questions or doubts, please uh, directly uh, text on the chat. Uh, I'm not, I, will, I won't be able to see on the chat, but then you can stop and ask the question directly. So as in the previous uh, week, uh, when I mentioned about the uh, tower, uh, the nacelle and the components, what you see on the right is, uh, is a complete tower segment. Here, from a distant view, you can't uh, judge whether in how many uh, stages it is made. Sometimes the stages is one, two, three, or four, or it could be even less than, usually it is three segments. That is in the sense that, the, uh, let me know if I'm able to share you an arrow. Um, yeah. So the tower segment is will be in like this. Uh, the bottom part will be in cylinder segment all through and has got so many uh, sections as well. There's a second section as well in this. Also, it is part cylinder and part a uh, little bit conical. And then the third part is also conical. So on top of this box, what you see here in the zoom the video is this what it sits here. Uh, it keeps varying the size and the mass of the whole top nacelle ma uh, mass and the rotor mass keeps changing based on the design. So as I was talking about uh, how do we uh, design and consider the parameters before we jump to the uh, final um, main design of the tower. Globally, um, you take the, uh, whenever a turbine is designed, you sit in front of the desktop. It doesn't mean that it has to be designed for that particular state or country or that particular location. So whenever uh, a design is started, first they see in uh, the whole world, there are three different types of wind and wind class that is, uh, has been categorized as in the table right hand and this one, this table, both comes from different standards, but then they all uh, uh, would uh, make you to design a similar kind of a turbine. The one on the right hand side is a GL20 turn uh, guideline. So what did the, these three tell is, these three meaning of these classes is class one, is the highest class. That's the most rigorous class whenever a turbine gets designed. Class two is something next to it, and it has also got class two A, two B, and two C again uh, into its uh, subdivisions, as well as class three A, three B, and three C. What does the this mean? Is like for example, in a simplest case, let me put in this way uh, to understand the design perspective. Let's say you have a, a small Maruti car that has been designed in uh, different, it can run in all the states, it can go in any uh, road function. So it could be a dirt road, it could be a good road, so or it could be a mountain road. Let's say that you you had decided one fine day to take it on a mountain and it didn't 
climb the first uh, level itself then you would be thinking was this car designed for it to handle a mountain road so in that sim similar situation is what how the turbine design also takes place like if we are were, were to design something the specific target is in class 2 we would try to design something close to class 1 uh, a b c so it would be class 1 c which will be in the higher uh, loaded uh, region of the wing and then using that as a option we would uh, try to position the wind turbines in class 2 a and 2 b the reason is that like when we try to offer a product like say your car you try to have different uh, features and functions uh, it comes with uh, audio systems without audio systems with uh, basic manual and automatic functions similar way the turbine also uh, is designed to make sure that it is able to handle like we don't try to design every day one new uh, factor of turbine so in in order to properly optimize they we make sure that the turbine as well as the manufacturing all those things we had designed it in the higher class and uh, push it uh, to the next lower immediate lower class there are uh, softwares such as wasp or even um, other wind pro Bef uh, before a site is selected let's say if this is a site that is in any da good wind uh, region so at least 1 to 2 years of data is uh, required so how this data is collected is like usually at the initial stage when the land is completely barren there's no wind turbines nothing so they would put an anemometer mast which would be standing as high as the turbine height and they would have three different mast heights let's say this turbine is at 70 meters so they would have one at 70 meters a met mast one at 60 one at 80 so they will put at three different locations three mast on the same uh, anemometers on the same mast and then they will measure what's the wind speed throughout the uh, one to two year period and assess the whole hectare of land let's say if you are putting take consider this 1 hectare of land they would put, probably put four corners four uh, met mast and a certain how good is the wind throughout the year for the next couple of years and also in all the directions like north east south west so as the turbine gets designed so as i said that this is a a, a basic criteria whenever a uh, customer is given a data what's the uh, turbine rating so that's how the uh, language is talked here you see is it's a power curve like whenever you ask for a car uh, you would first your question would be what's the mileage or is it petrol or diesel you would try to ask some basic specification is it a four seater car or a six seater car in that similar fashion uh, power curve decides what kind of turbine this is in this case like what you see here it's uh, like almost getting saturated at 1500 kilowatt that's 1.5 megawatt and this is coming from a ge wind turbine and what you see is that as uh, this is a graph between wind speed and the electrical power of the generator at various wind speeds this is from a actual tur designed turbine so it attains a maximum rated wind speed a rated power and uh, this is how a power curve of a wind turbine is defined or a product of a wind turbine is defined so in the world the this value is close to now 14 or 15 megawatt what you see here is 1.6 megawatt now the turbine size has gone so high that it is uh, at the moment generating one turbine itself is generating 12 to 15 megawatt of power kilowatt hour in one hour how does this gets defined is 1500 kilowatt in one hour if if the wind speed is at 12 meters per second in constant then it will be able to generate that the power of 1200 to or 1500 kilowatt of power looking at the uh, way in which it tries to uh, 
get started is like minimum it requires is three meters per second of velocity and the cutout is 24 meters per second in the sense that uh, when there is no wind it won't do anything probably just it will be just idling uh, and we'll try and wait for the wind to pick up at three meters per second so how it will sense three meters per second is based on the anemometer which sits on the top of the turbine as you can see here in this uh, top here, there's an anemometer which senses the wind for every three seconds, three minutes, as well as 10 minute average. And then tells to the ro um, rotor saying that yes, the wind is good and it's being consistent, it will start rotating. So in this case, let's say if it is starting at three meters per second, then it will continuously tell yes, three meters per second, keep the blade at this specific uh, pitch angles, and then it will try to derive the torque from the blade wind as let's say when the uh, the designed uh, wind speed is 12 meters per second so it would try to go and catch for each wind speed there is a torque the rotor will look what's the best torque that it can derive for based on which pitch angle and then it would try to increase the power and then try to achieve and uh, saturate this power so as I was mentioning about different parts of the gearbox uh, or the nacelle on the top, the important consideration when we design the uh, tower is that at initial stage, you will not be able to know when we are completely designing a new turbine, let's say a 15 megawatt turbine, that's the latest in the world uh, 15 megawatt. If some people are coming with a 20 megawatt and the size is usually either taken as a historical reference. If there is no historical reference, the only way to is start estimating what would be the mass of the generator, what would be the mass of the gearbox, mass of the hub or the rotor, and then what would be the mass of this frame which is sitting on the top. So all these masses are discussed with suppliers of uh, those respective like generator, you would have a separate supplier we have to discuss what is the expected uh, uh, generator capacity. Then they would uh, try to give an estimate of what could be the mass and the inertia details. So that is how uh, masses are estimated. And then uh, it is considered as a uh, lumped mass uh, for a tower top design. So as I um, was uh, we'll uh, go uh, proceed towards how the design of uh, tower takes place. So there are two uh, ways. One is uh, it is designed for onshore as well as offshore. For onshore, uh, the standard and as well as the rigorous of uh, evaluation is a little bit lesser than an offshore. In offshore case, the loads are even a little bit higher than on an onshore wind turbine. Uh, there are additional conditions that are to be considered. So taking on the onshore turbines, so as you see the lattice turbine here, that's the truss tower or a lattice turbine, and uh, there are various designs. If you go down south to Kanyakumari or those places, uh, close to the highway, you will be see, uh, seeing a lot of lattice uh, structured turbines. The reason earlier in stages uh, or even in countries where like um, the economic of the country is growing, where they see the cost is a major factor, the most cheapest option is the uh, trust uh, lattice tower. The next uh, good option is going with the tubular towers. This also comes in the format of uh, uh, a mix of either this tubular tower, is, which is in the full uh, structural steel. Half it could be concrete and half it, it is steel. There are other uh, variants uh, that is also being uh, designed and tested in India. It's like up to this section, three fourth of the section, it is completely tubular uh, steel. And then the rest is uh, lattice just this part of the lattice is kept on the top and then they could do the same thing. So there are various combinations of this tower design. So 
Uh, and also there is new trend of they're trying to see uh, if they can go for uh, fiberglass made um, towers like there could be epoxy glass fiber towers that is being tried and tested then there is a new design also uh, is getting evolved that is the um, uh, timber wood based uh, fibers like uh, wood itself is being the best uh, natural fiber that is also being tested to make sure that the tower can handle those loads. So all the reason why they are going and trying all these different kinds of material is that to um, one third of the cost of the turbine is coming from tower itself. So in order to reduce and minimize there uh, so many options is, uh, for the design of the towers. So in the fact, what you see here, since I was in Australia, I did present in this uh, presentation in Australia as well. So I had to take an example, the maximum height uh, where it is uh, in so far is standing as 270 meter height. Um, whereas in the uh, world's tallest one is at 164 meter hub height. When I say hub height, this location where the rotor pointer is, is the hub height. One more thing that I wanted to add was like, what you could see here is that the tower base is started increasing a lot. So that also puts a constraint on the transportation. So uh, the legal transportation for any highway uh, in the world uh, as a standard, if you say is 4.2 meter in diameter is what you can take at the max on a loaded truck. But then uh, when it goes beyond, so what they do is they have tried to split the tower in the length along this length uh, length fashion or longitudinal fashion and then they would assemble it on the side. Uh, so the bolts will be along this length. So the new concept uh, LST towers as they are shortly uh, known as, uh, they come in a larger diameter base but then split along the length of this tower. On the other hand, as I said, was the offshore turbines. So the design is completely different. So you could see the structure uh, where some uh, um, one fourth part of the tower would be in submersible under the sea and would be having a different kind of foundation holding the whole tower on the top. So the offshore turbines are very, very massive in size as well as the power is also very high usually the six megawatt onwards are uh, considered as an offshore uh, turbines. The reason why uh, they are going for a six megawatt plus turbines in offshore is because the cost uh, what it takes and the power is what it uh, uh, considers from the wind uh, and to the factor that okay for a long term perspective like 30 years design life the sizes are very massive. Is there any questions which you'd like to ask? Hello, am I hearing uh, if I can have some feedback in time to time uh, so that I have a um, confidence that there is no uh, loss in internet connection or com uh, communication? Can anyone respond? Yes, sir. It's all clear, sir. Please go ahead, sir. Yeah, thank you. Yes, sir. Ah, yes. So as I was uh, talking about the different kinds of um, offshore and onshore turbine designs. So how exactly this design is, let's say we take a onshore uh, turbine on the land. So three different parameters that is considered is soft, 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 stiff, and stiff, stiff. What does this mean exactly on tower is that this whole tower, when it, as it is standing on the land, it could be soft, soft, means that the whole turbine has got more bending mo movements at the bottom. That it means that uh, the material is a little uh, very highly flexible, but then 
the life of uh, the thickness distribution is very very uh, sleek and slender uh, and uh, the natural it is less than the natural frequency of the rotor and as the, as well as the blade rotor and blade passing frequency so what is does this mean is that like when you have the natural frequency of the rotor um, so how do i consider uh, this value is like for example when the rotor is rotating at 24 rpm so your if you divide 24 by 60 so that would give you about 0.4 hertz and uh, if that value is standing and if you have the natural frequency of the tower and compare with that and you put up a line then you can see that how the uh, the tower uh, design is whether it is in soft soft stage or it is in soft stiff stage or in stiff stiff stage um, so let me take from soft soft to soft uh, stiff stiff what does this mean is that it is very very stiff in the sense that the thickness is very much uh, uh, considered in such a way that it is too much uh, heavy or uh, too much weighing compared to its design and then it is also more than the blade 3p pass frequency values so it means that the bending moment is very very less on the tower as a whole in the bottom uh, foundation and uh, uh, it is designed for a various reason is that okay if the location of the site has got very strong winds then they would probably consider a stiff stiff model if there is a uh, the uh, in turbulence intensity is somewhere moderate then they would consider something like a soft stiff so this is so having a design something at the center is like an economical uh, point of view like it is some cost wise it is cheaper as well as doing the functional all of them are doing the functional um, uh, design wise it is able to deliver but then the cost of the tower, uh, tower will be much economical when they go with soft stiff mostly 60% uh, of the turbines in the last 10 to 15 years as the materials have been developed well and are being designed in the soft stiff stages so what was the necessary that they had to go between soft 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 stiff and stiff stiff like there was in um, in the year 1998 in gujarat there was a hurricane uh, kind of a cyclonic effect so the wind speeds that were measured were somewhere close to 152 kilometers per hour that's like 42 meters per second on a turbine usually this 42 meters per second is also a design consideration uh, like once in a 50 year uh, period that this wind speed will be coming uh, at some point of time but then it also reached beyond those wind, uh, wind design wind speed limits so there was a major catastrophe in the wind farm uh, in the state of Gujarat where uh, some of the towers did fell flat because they were not able to withstand those wind speeds and uh, the tower started shaking so much vigorously that the uh, resonancy uh, or frequent uh, resonant frequency had uh, damaged the complete tower so that was the case uh, that happened so they are very much cautious to look at the site and make a complete estimate and see that whether the designed tower can withstand those extreme forces so this picture uh, was taken actually from an uh, research article where they were able to see that the wind speed was beyond uh, the actual design limits so as i was talking about the different uh, the geometry of the tower which is like the bottom half is usually made in cylinder and the second half is also made in cylinder and has got varying thickness from bottom to top so as here in this case we could see here that the bottom thickness shell is about 4 meters in diameter and has got a thickness of about 30 mm uh, there are no stiffeners or anything that is placed inside these shells they are completely flat rectangular plates 
and then they are uh, they are rolled and then welded along the length of the each shell that is how they get formed so here you could see that the uh, thickness is, as it goes up is also varying between uh, 14 to 16 mm some of the thickness also goes as low as 8 mm thickness so why uh, they are going for these kind of thickness is the reason that okay when you try to do the model analysis as well as bucking analysis you you need you are forced to consider thickness as a major parameter as well so when a uh, tower is designed it is on, not only designed for one particular uh, design as i said it is not only for 1 megawatt 2 megawatt or 3 megawatt the world's biggest is now beyond 9 megawatt so what uh, they would uh, as any designer they would do is like they will try to do the first tower top mass estimation the tower top mass is nothing but what would be the mass of the old blades along with the rotor hub and the nacelle so that is the first mass so let's say that if we are going to design a one megawatt turbine so it's if it is mass is completely known are we coming under that range near or closer range if you are trying to overload the tower top then it means that you are putting a so much of mass on the top which the whole turbine is carrying and it is as an unnecessary uh, cost uh, implication as well as uh, we have to see how operational wise the tower top is playing a major role so based on those factor the tower top mass is considered so if it is coming under the range yes or no then it goes an iteration within itself then if it is making a factor yes okay that it is considered okay with this in these limits like based on historical values based on uh, having factors considered uh, speaking with the suppliers then they uh, decide what should be the shell thickness and height for all of the uh, total tower let's say in this case that we designed a tower at a height of 70 meters so we considered we will have two or one cylinder uh, section and then one tapered section so this section usually is tapered uh, the reason there are a couple of reasons why they are tapered one is to make sure that the when the blade is completely bent uh, from its uh, tip the tip shouldn't be touching the tower if it is like let's say that instead of it has been designed taper in the top if it has been de designed fully cylindrical up to the top it means that it is unnecessarily weighing too much of self weight as well as too much of material for it and also the cost so that's the reason that one way is to taper it second is major functional is to make sure that the tip is not touching to the tower those are the two major factors as well as also having the aerodynamic consideration how uh, the resonance effect because of the blade is not coinciding with the tower natural frequency so as we decide those factors the model analysis is and is done and it is delivered in the form of a Campbell plot where you try to check what how is the natural frequency of the tower without having all these blades and everything assembled just the tower only along with the uh, uh, lumped mass on the top what's the natural frequency of the whole tower so if the natural frequency of the tower and the uh, rotor frequency blade passing frequency matches so what are the consideration that has to be done in in terms of control system so what here it may uh, the rotor frequency here means is the uh, rotor hub frequency the what is the let's say that the tower uh, the turbine is designed at uh, 24 rpm so the blade each blade passes at a specific frequency as well so if there are three blades then it is called 3p if it is so they would see the first natural frequency of the blade uh, as 1p is not coinciding uh, with the tower natural frequency so how that is uh, avoided i'll explain in the next couple of slides so this is how uh, the whole dna process of the tower design is considered so when the natural frequencies are away and if it is matching good then the final design is uh, considered for uh, let's say the uh, uh, 
uh, in terms of manufacturing, the manufacturing drawings are given based on the outcome of the tower design, final tower design. If it doesn't match, then there's again an iteration again, and then uh, it is rechecked when the final mass of the tower top is decided. In the sense that as the design gets progress, there are different teams which works on the nacelle top only and also on the uh, tower. So they have to come back to say that what's the final mass and that it's not affecting the tower as a whole. So that is reiterated and again these processes are rechecked again before final manufacturing is done. Let's go a little bit practical what exactly when I, I had a chance when I started in the wind turbine industry to uh, design and do the initial tower top mass estimation and check how the model analysis of the tower was behaving. This is an actual site and this is this turbine is still running in a place called in uh, Tirnal uh, in uh, Tirnal near a place called Putumalai. That's the location where this turbine has been sited. It is standing at a height of 70 meters and this is the whole length, a uh, blade length of 24 meters at a hub height of 70 meters. So the specification, as I said, based on the power curve is 700 kilowatt. You could see here that the bottom shell uh, thickness was at 20 millimeters and then the shell thickness at the top, at the taper, uh, taper region is about 8 mm. So the actual mass, what you see is taking from the blade point of view, each blade was about 2200 to 2500 kg. So when you multiply by three and along with the hub, the center for cast metal that was standing at, at seven tons, the whole component generator gearbox and as well as the main chair and the frames, all electric cabinets all put together. This was at a uh, weighing about 27 tons on the top. 27 ton is 27,000 kgs. So this was the whole mass that was considered on the uh, uh, tower, which was standing at a height of about 70 meters. Let me... So this is the picture uh, taken from the straight from the bottom, how it looks like. You could see that uh, here, the, this uh, part, which is all glass fiber, they all look a uh, big. But then uh, structurally, they don't do much to the uh, turbine's weight. The major factor is these blades, and as well as the hub, and as, well as the nacelle. So you could see a close-up picture of how the welded section uh, along the length of the uh, height of the tower is. And uh, major thing was that how close this would be uh, to the tower surface area. So when we tried to design the, uh, when we did the model, model analysis, we were able to get the initial frequencies. So the initial first three to six frequencies are very important. So in this case, when the natural frequency of the tower was at 0.4 hertz, what does this mean is like when you try to multiply this value into 60, you would get uh, the R RPM as 24 RPM, that's the rotor RPM. Whenever it is rotating at 24 RPM, it means that the tower would be having a natural frequency resonating at that instant. So what, how would we um, uh, evade or, um, or how would we avoid the resonance when the tower is always operational uh, in operation and at 24 RPM. There are RPMs like 0, 5, 10, 20. So it goes stage by stage every RPM and then reaches the final RPM. Let's say in one of the RPM, uh, it has uh, has resonated with this frequency. So we it is not good for the turbine during its full design stage or, for, or throughout its life. So it is uh, necessary to look in how to avoid those natural frequencies. So when it is being designed, uh, we have to uh, consider that as a major factor to make sure that the turbine doesn't lose its uh, structural uh, life 
uh, for 20 years or 25 years or 30 years. The table on the right is a 1.7 megawatt turbine uh, having a different kind of frequencies as you could see. Uh, here, the same three-bladed rotor, but then the mass is completely changed. Here it was 27 tons on the top. Here it was about 80 tons on the top. So that's the difference when, and you could see the frequency at 0.3 hertz. So it would come around a rotor RPM about 17 to 18 RPM. So as I said that uh, we see uh, the model uh, results and see how the deflection, the main thing is that the frequency at the different modes, that is the important consideration when we finalize the design. Based on the previous uh, couple of slides that I showed the uh, different frequencies, this is how when you do it in ANSYS or any other simulation software, the mode shapes will look like. Uh, this is a little bit zoomed one. The real one uh, in uh, practice also you would be uh, looking at this, but then it won't go so much into 4P mode that the tower is uh, really oscillating. Uh, it is definitely, uh, the tower does go definitely to 3P mode and uh, make sure that it doesn't uh, resonate too much in the uh, blade passing frequencies. So how do we overcome the tower resonance frequency? What, how do, what happens when the interference takes place? Here is a, probably a, show a small video of this. So what happens is that as the rotor blade starts uh, picking up the wind and uh, starts rotating, the natural frequency of the tower definitely coincides with the blade passing frequency. So in order to overcome that, they would try and put up a lookup table within the control systems and uh, they will try to pitch out or pitch in the blade. The, the term pitch in pitch out means that the whole blade would uh, change its angle of attack with respect to the wind which it sees and it would be a very short period let's say that uh, probably five to ten seconds that whenever it reaches those frequencies it has to avoid. So how it communicates is through the control system and it tells the com control system tells to the uh, ear synchronous pitch blading, pitch blade to pitch out or pitch in and make sure that the tower doesn't resonate. It would resonate, but then the uh, period would be very short. So in that sense, whenever there is a start or stop or any other events the turbine sees, uh, the tower would start resonating. So minimizing those resonance is a key factor and how this is how it is done by making sure that in the control system, the pitch in pitch out operation is uh, properly uh, assessed and it is also executing at the field level. So why it is necessary is that like when you see at different wind speeds throughout the year, like as the turbine is designed for 20 to 30 years, let's say in particular, one particular year, you have a dominant month or a dominant time of the year, eight meters per second wind. And in that region, you would see that the frequencies, uh, resonant frequencies are high. It, the control system algorithm uh, or the process is written so that the, those frequencies are avoided. So that here you could see that time in seconds for each of those wind speeds, how the, uh, they would try to avoid the resonant frequencies. So, as I mentioned, it avoid resonance frequencies. Here, we are, this is a snapshot from a uh, guideline, which says that at least in a year, you should uh, a turbine design has to consider a thousand times a startup procedure. It means that like it would start at three meters per second at least thousand times, and at least it would have crossed so many times uh, at those natural frequencies. 
so that's the reason that this is being uh, given in importance there are other uh, cases like for example when there is a gust in the wind or increase in turbulence in the wind that would also affect the frequency of the tower so how if you have to imagine in a in a different practical manner let's say if we are asking hussein bolt to run every day an olympic uh, uh, marathon running or a fast uh, sprint running he would uh, lose his energy potential within 10 days he wouldn't be able to do for a longer uh, period of his age uh, criteria so he would try uh, so in order to save the energy with him he would only do a short sprints of time and do the exercise on need need basis and conserve his energy that's how if you have to com compare that to a tower the tower also will try to conserve its energy by making sure that it is not its fatigue life is not uh, getting damaged because of these resonant frequencies so as i have said that uh, there are so many design load cases that a turbine has to go through as well as this also uh, uh, equally affects the design of the turbine in this what you would see here is like this is uh, extract from iec guideline where uh, there are eight different cases like power production power production with fault what happens when it is only the startup case what happens when it is a normal shutdown emergency shutdown or when it is just idling or what happens when it is only part case so i can a little bit explain what exactly each column is so in this column for different for a case of this so here it is normal uh, turbulence model having a wind input and at a hub height there's a, ve a velocity and at what is the cutout velocity and for those each wind speeds let's say 3 mm per second to 3 m per second to 25 m per second uh, so there is a step considered 3 5 10 so every 2 m per second those are the wind speeds considered and then the ultimate as well as the partial as well as the partial safety factor that has to be considered uh, is implemented on the tower design so this is how the simulation uh, works on the complete turbine and also it is uh, based on these simulations loads are derived and uh, this would be about 2500 to 3000 simulations cases in the sense that every case is at least it would have 6 to 10 cases uh, at least as a bare minimum going on uh, i would uh, go to a direct demo session how uh, we do directly in ansys building up the geometry and uh, uh, 